Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation, or any part thereof, is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an independent educational grant from Celgene. This program was presented by Medscape Education Global. Hello, I'm John Gribben from Barts Cancer Institute, Queen Mary University of London in the UK. Welcome to this program titled Best Practice Treatment of Relapsed Refractory Indolent Non-Hodgkin's Lymphoma Case Insights. Joining me today are John Leonard from the Weill Cornell Medicine in, in New York, United States, Stefan Luminari from the University of Modena, Reggio Emilia in Italy, and Gilles Salle from the Claude Bernard University of Lyon in France. So what we're going to be discussing today is the optimal treatment selection for individual patients with relapsed refractory indolent non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. We're going to be thinking and talking about the optimal management of side effects in individual patient with relapsed refractory indolent non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. And we're going to do that in the setting of taking us through some real case clinical scenarios where I'm going to be asking each of our experts to comment on what their thought process is on the way in which this case patient was approached and think about how we can use these cases to illustrate how we think about um, management of relapsed refractory non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So let's just go straight into our first case. This is a patient of mine, a 61-year-old woman who had a previous medical history of hypothyroidism but was otherwise fit and well and had a ECOG performance status of zero. In April of 2014, she presented with inguinal lymph node swelling and a biopsy revealed she had a follicular lymphoma grade one. A PET CT scan performed at that time revealed enlarged lymph nodes above and below the diaphragm, none of which had a very high SUV, so nothing to suggest transformation, and she had non-bulky adenopathy at that time. Bone marrow performed at that time showed that she had 20% involvement with follicular lymphoma in the paratubecular areas, and her hemoglobin was normal at 126 grams per liter. She was initially followed on a watch and wait approach until February of 2016, when she presented with leg, left leg swelling. We performed a Doppler scan to rule out the evidence of a DVT, and this showed no evidence of a DVT, but did show large lymph nodes within the pelvis. A, a repeat lymph node biopsy at that time confirmed she still had follicular lymphoma, now grade one to two, and her PET-CT scan showed markedly increased lymphadenopathy, still no areas of increased SUV, and no evidence of to suggest transformation. Her hemoglobin, however, had dropped to 96 grams per liter at that time, and her LDH was normal at 225 with an upper limit of normal of 250. So by our staging, she was a flippy uh, stage two high, or high risk patient. So in February 2016, we started on uh, frontline treatment. And why don't I just start off then by, John, why don't you talk about in a lady such as this, what would be your for first preferred first line treatment for uh, follicular lymphoma in this setting? Sure, so this is a very typical presentation. This is a patient who's had a good period, almost two years of watch and wait. So the question of does she need therapy? I think uh, she's clearly reached a point based on her symptoms, her extent of disease, her anemia, uh, she's ready for treatment. And in my mind, for someone ready for treatment, the questions that I would typically ask are, is this a case where one might consider single agent rituximab? Is it a patient where I would give bendamustine-based chemoimmunotherapy? Or is this a patient that I would give CHOP-based chemotherapy? Those would be my typical three scenarios. I think this patient has more disease than would be typically treated with single agent rituximab. So I would not be leaning toward single agent rituximab in this patient. And I don't think we have any signs of transformation of this, in this patient um, at this point in time. I mean, she's got a normal LDH, she has low SUVs, 
Uh, and so this is a patient who I would also have treated with uh, bendamustine-based uh, chemoimmunotherapy, and I would have given uh, our bendamustine as was chosen um, by you in this case. So, so Stefan, is there anything different about the way that a clinician in Europe might approach the case compared to how you've heard John discuss how um, sitting in New York, he would approach this uh, lymphoma? Or do you think the treatment approach uh, thinking is, is very similar? Uh, thank you uh, for the question. The, the case uh, as in specific features of uh, a more aggressive form of follicular lymphoma uh, however, I think that uh, in Europe, and at least in the, the southern Europe, I think in the Latin part of Europe, uh, if a treatment is needed, and so I mean if immunochemotherapy is needed, probably there is a high, higher chance of, for this patient to receive a CHOP-based uh, immunochemotherapy. Uh, because if you plan a, a program, a treatment program, for this patient that not only accounts for the first line, but also for a, an eventual relapse, it would be easier based on what we have. We have less new drugs, less new agents in Europe uh, to save this patient with a, a, a lighter uh, option like bendamustin as second line. So uh, I would favor uh, the choice of giving this patient our bendamustin, but I'm not excluding our CHOP as a priori hypothesis because I think that this option is probably better suited if you plan an overall, uh, a, a more complete treatment plan for this patient, also including the risk of a, a, a relapse. Uh, as an ad additional comment, uh, the use of rituximab as monotherapy uh, in patients with uh, advanced stage for lipid lymphoma low tumor burden uh, is less used in Europe, at least from my perspective, than uh, it is used in the uh, United States. So, as you said, this patient did receive uh, our bendamustine for six cycles. At my own personal preference, I, I kind of often like to try to save the anthracycline in case, uh, you know, to need to use it at a time of uh, transformation that may occur later is my kind of thought process in doing this. So, so Gilles, of course, you, you uh, ran the PRIMA trial. What, what's your view now on uh, would you use maintenance after in this sort of patient? Thank you, John, for, for asking about maintenance. And um, I think what we have shown with the PRIMA trial is that in patients that were responding to first-line treatment, induction treatment of a combination of chemotherapy plus rituximab, the use of rituximab maintenance led in a prolongation of progression-free survival, but also in the delay of the time to next anti-lymphoma treatment and delay in the time to next chemotherapy. The 10-year update of the trial that was just uh, published a few months ago showed that at 10 years after the initiation of maintenance, half of the patients with this disease, which uh, some of, many of them had a high tumor burden like that one, um, were free of progression. And almost uh, two-thirds of them did not have to restart a new treatment if they received maintenance. So I think it's a very nice and good option for the patient, even if on the long-term overall survival is strictly identical between those patients that receive maintenance and those that need not. But at least patients don't have to come back to the hospital to start a new treatment. Having said that, the limitation of PRIMA is that the trial was performed at a time where bendamustine was not widely used, and the results are definitely applicable to patients that receive CHOP or CVP as a backbone chemo. Um, there are a couple of experiences and indirect indications that uh, rituximab maintenance is also valid for those patients that receive uh, uh, bendamustine inductions, such as uh, uh, that one. Probably considering that the rate of infections um, after bendamustine may be slightly higher and maybe further increased by the use of maintenance, so it may have to be applied a little bit more carefully, I will say. But I think the benefit is probably similar after we don't have as strong evidence that it is. So for this patient, if you will have used rituximab and as you did in 2016 February, I will advise this patient to take rituximab maintenance. Now John, can I come back to you on that? Because I think we get the sense that in the US there's less favorable approach to uh, maintenance than there is in Europe. 
uh, even though in the US rituximab is used so often. Uh, what's your view on maintenance in this setting? Yes, I think uh, I agree with all of the, the caveats that Jill mentioned. Uh, uh, applying data with maintenance after RCHOP or RCVP based on PRIMA is a little more clear than applying it in this situation as far as the benefit and as far as the risk. Um, I, I certainly discuss maintenance with all of my, uh, my patients in this sort of situation. I would generally lean against maintenance because of the absence of the absence of an overall survival benefit and the less, the, the less frequent data uh, with uh, our bendamustine and maintenance, as well as, as you'll mention, the potential for increased infections uh, after bendamustine when maintenance is used. That said, I, it's hard to argue one way or another strongly. I would say that uh, when I present it to my patients, and obviously, uh, you know, the patient perspective is influenced by the physician perspective, um, most patients uh, choose not to pursue maintenance and appreciate the break from therapy. Uh, and so uh, I don't know if it's a geographic preference or, or what, but uh, um, I've seen it both ways in the U.S. And the reality is, is that I think either one is reasonable. You really have to think about the pros and cons and, and discuss it with the patient. Obviously, the key question is who really needs maintenance and who can get away without maintenance? And we have ongoing studies largely in Europe trying to answer that question. So Stefan, the other, um, this was February 2016, this was before gallium, but obviously an approach could have been to use an abinutuzumab uh, containing regimen. Are, are you in, and this patient did have a flippy 2 would you ever consider uh, using abinutuzumab containing regimen frontline rather than rituximab here? Uh, so we are discussing about clinical practice of uh, outside clinical trial. So yes, uh, if the patient uh, is seen today, uh, obinotuzumab, at least in Italy, uh, combined with chemo, CHOP or bendamustin, is an option that is reimbursed by the national health system uh, because the patient is in high risk according to FLIPI. Uh, however, uh, uh, I think that uh, the, the option of obinotuzumab uh, would not be my favorite option uh, because, yes, the patient is high risk, but the, the risk of this patient is because only because... Uh, uh, she's 61, so only one age above the age of 60. So uh, this uh, flippy is formally iris, but uh, the the real risk is less than that is measured by flippy. So flippy is a good measure of risk, but uh, in this intermediate case, uh, like a flippy class of two, uh, it doesn't really reflect, in my, from my point of view, the, the real risk of uh, uh, achieving uh, having a, an early relapse. Uh, it would be different if the patient had a flippy of three or four. In this case, obinotuzumab would be a, a best, the best option for me in this patient. Thinking of relapse, I think we should uh, get on because we want to get to the management of the relapse setting. So let's go back to the case. So she received six cycles of our bendamustine. She tolerated it very well and her outcome PET scan showed that she achieved a metabolic complete remission. Um, she was uh, treated with maintenance uh, Q2 monthly, and in August of 2016, uh, completed maintenance uh, with rituximab and was doing very well for the next two years. And in November 2018, she presented again, uh, complaining of left leg swelling. Uh, again, the Doppler showed no evidence of DVT. Her PET scan, however, did show that she'd progression above and below the diaphragm, and she had a fairly large node at this point at 10 centimeters. The SUV max was uh, 12.4, and her LDH was 340, uh, which was uh, an upper limit of normal of 250, so an elevated LDH. And the view of the fact that the SUV was up, the uh, LDH was increased. Uh, I directed a biopsy towards the area on the PET scan showing the highest level of activity, but this showed a continued uh, follicular lymphoma grade one to two. So um, here we have now, uh, now she's 63 or you know, in a little bit, she tolerated her chemotherapy well. Uh, why don't I uh, go back into that same order again? John, what would be your preferred second line treatment here? So this is a patient who uh, I think is, it's an interesting uh, situation because she had a reasonable response, I mean, a two-year remission, but progressed soon after 
uh, relatively soon after reaching that two-year mark, uh, and also uh, soon after completing her maintenance therapy. As I, uh, as I, unless I'm misinterpreting, and I think that's that's correct. About two years. Is yeah. that correct, John? Yeah, yeah that's correct. So, yeah. so this is a um, this is a scenario where, you know, she fits into a a good prognosis group on that basis, meaning beyond two years. But there's some feeling that really this is uh, not someone who had a five-year or 10-year remission. So it really makes me wonder a little bit about uh, some element of chemo resistance here, some element of uh, rituximab resistance here, uh, even though classically speaking, uh, she doesn't have resistant disease. It's on the spectrum, perhaps a little more resistant than the person who has a quite a long, a long remission. So that would make me think a little bit about doing something a little bit different. Um, clearly giving this patient CHOP, uh, CHOP-based therapy, whether it's with rituximab or perhaps obinutuzumab, would be a very reasonable thing to do. Um, on the other hand, uh, she does not have transformation here. Uh, you've, you've biopsied the area. And I think giving a lenalidomide-based treatment would be a, a very reasonable thing to consider. Um, given that uh, she does meet the criteria of patients who have done well with lenalidomide-based treatment uh, and the R-squared regimen would be a reasonable approach. This patient, I think I would uh, uh, treat with lenalidomide, uh, but I would also be, uh, again, watching very carefully and, and a bit concerned that this is someone who may cycle through various treatments um, relatively quickly, given that her first remission was only just over two years. So, Gilles, let's uh, imagine a scenario here that this woman hadn't uh, relapsed after she'd completed maintenance, but had relapsed uh, early on in maintenance. So she'd relapsed one year into receiving maintenance. Does that change the way that you think about such a case? Um, does it alter your approach? And, and, and while you're on that subject, what do you think of, of John's thought process in terms of how he comes to his second line treatment? Thank you. I think... Um... We take into consideration different um, things and, and the fact to relapse during maintenance, um, which happens in 15, 20% of this patient, has been associated with a poor outcome. Um, as you did, I will really chase for transformation and you have eliminated that. We know that many of these patients, probably 30, 40% of them, even more after bendamustine, with early relapse have transformed disease. Um, if she didn't have transformed disease, we are left with a couple of um, possibilities, which are repeating chemo, CHOP. Um, I think it's a little bit too short to think about repeating BENDA, but if this was a late relapse, this would have been an option, taking into account the potential long-term heme toxicities. An immune-based approach, as John described, I think there is another approach that might be discussed uh, in Europe and in some centers, which will be uh, a reinduction with some cytotoxic agent and uh, discussing uh, uh, transplant, autotransplant for this patient. There are indirect data suggesting that this could be an option for early relapses and that those patients may eventually enjoy a long-term progression free after transplant. She's right now 63 or something like that. So I think this yeah, is sure. a reasonable yeah. option at her age. She had a very good performance status. Um, I will have discussed that with a patient. Obviously, it's not a decision that uh, we will make um, on our own. And I think all options are acceptable. Another chemo, CHOP, with rituximab in this case probably, um, R-square, the combination of... Uh, rituximab and lenalidomide or with obinutuzumab galen regimen, or eventually reinduction with some form of chemo and, and transplant three courses of CHOP, for instance. Um, I think an early relapse will tend to um, privilege probably autologous transplant, but I think it's a reasonable discussion to have with the patient, especially when we can rule out transformation. I'm not fully sure that for the patient in which transformation has been formally eliminated, there is a long-term benefit of such an approach. And Stefan, let's imagine the scenario here. I mean, she's 63 and she's fit, but what if she was more elderly and had more comorbidities? How does that factor into 
thinking about treatment of relapse uh, refractory follicular lymphoma. In addition to what has been already discussed, uh, if the patient is, uh, is older than, and, and less fit than uh, uh, how she is now, I think that the, 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 the set of options that are available are really limited. At least uh, uh, in my country, in Italy, when we don't have R-square uh, as a registered or reimbursed option, that of course would be the best treatment, mainly because of the, the safety profile, the manageability of the treatment. In this case, uh, I think that, uh, as already stated, uh, with challenge with bendamastin at lower doses than induction, of course, would be a reasonable option, uh, but also CVP. Uh, so avoiding the, the, the exposition to doxorubicin of CHOP would be an equally uh, good option for, for this patient, of course. Uh, I would not be happy with single agent therapy. There are some that are available, but I would not be happy with an option that only offer my patient a median PFS of around one year, as that is what we see with the single agent uh, activity of, in this setting. Okay. Well, I'm glad to hear that you all liked the R squared regimen because, of course, uh, I did treat this patient with um, R lenalidomide. Uh, in fact, one of the factors that we didn't discuss among ourselves was a patient's choice. And now that we have these so-called chemo-free type regimens, as we might think of for um, rituximab lenalidomide, uh, this woman was very keen to avoid conventional chemotherapy. So she tolerated the treatment well. She needed some dose reductions um, from the regular 20 milligram dose to tw 10 milligrams uh, intermittently for episodes of neutropenia, but otherwise tolerated it very well. Uh, she completed therapy in December 2019 and uh, remains now in CR and I've seen her very recently. So we've heard from all of you that you think that is uh, um, uh, a good option. So let's take us through thinking about relapsed refractory disease. This woman has relapsed once already. Gilles already mentioned the issue of a potential role for transplant in some circumstances, but um, uh, she's now this woman had R bendamustine, R lenalidomide. What would you consider how you would treat her at next relapse? Let's reverse the order and, and Stefan come back to you on this one. Oh, if she relapsed, then she is relapsing uh, after two courses of uh, immuno plus, uh, an immunochemotherapy and immuno uh, plus lenalidomide regimen. So in this case, this would be uh, an high risk patient. Uh, with uh, less chances of uh, achieving a next a, a new uh, durable remission. So in this case, my first option would be a clinical trial. Uh, of course, if available, uh, there are important new agents that have significant activity in, also in this hard to treat patient. Outside the clinical trial, the available options are, uh, are very limited. There, there are the PI3 kinase inhibitor that are available uh, at least in Italy as the unique uh, new agent uh, as an option. So uh, this would be probably my, my, my best choice, uh, my suggestion for the patient. Now, this woman presented with leg swelling. We did rule out she had a DVT, but of course it does make you think about um, what we know about uh, lenalidomide and its potential um, uh, ability to induce uh, clots. Uh, Gilles, do you, uh, do you use... Um, thromboembolic uh, prophylaxis in patients that you're treating with the R-squared regimen? Well, I think it's a case-by-case -case, uh, discussion. I think that for this patient who had uh, um, swelling of the leg, I will probably be intended to administer some um, oral agent, uh, uh, non-conventional um, uh, oh, non -conventional, uh, anticoagulant drugs. NACO, and um, I will offer that for at least one to three months and probably later switch to aspirin. Um, okay. um, for the other patients, I will recommend aspirin in general unless they have a contraindication to this drug. I think the risk of real thrombolytic disease does not justify um, low molecular weight heparin like we use in multiple myeloma, for instance, unless this is a patient that had a recent thromboembolic event and, and we should then be very careful. Um, it was interesting that in the trials that uh, uh, led to uh, the registration in R-square and relapse, 
the incidence of thrombombolic events were relatively low and not very different between the control arm with rituximab only versus ASQA, if I remember well. But I think we should be careful about that. Now, John, on that note, you were, of course, the first author on the AUGMENT trial. So apart from the, the neutropenia that was, in this case, mild, what are the other kind of side effect profiles that people who are using this regimen could expect to see and what should they be looking out for? I think the, uh, the principal added side effects compared to rituximab alone uh, relate to uh, uh, increased uh, infection risk, typically a mild infection risk, along with the cytopenias, rash, uh, fatigue, and uh, GI side effects, particularly uh, uh, diarrhea. I do uh, also note the thromboembolic uh, observation, probably because there's better disease control and a more rapid response that may counteract the, any uh, thromboembolic effect on, uh, on, uh, of lenalidomide. One question I would ask you, John, is, uh, and maybe others, is the, any concern about uh, future stem cell collection in a patient like this? And if you thought about uh, in this patient who might down the line need a stem cell uh, or ultimately go to stem cell, any concerns in your mind about that uh, as you strategize for her in the long term? Yeah, it's a very good question. I raised, uh, you know, Gilles already raised the issue of, of a potential transplant here. Um, uh, of course, there, there have been concerns on the use of, uh, you know, depleting the stem cell pool with r But of course, in multiple myeloma, where the disease, is, where the, the, the drug is used much more widely, we are able to, to collect, continue to collect stem cells under that setting. And uh, certainly, um, I've not had difficulty being able to collect sufficient stem cells uh, for patients after the use of the R squared regimen. And of course, we've got additional measures we can use now, uh, the addition of et etc., to be able to mobilize and collect more cells. I haven't seen any evidence that patients who've received this regimen have delayed engraftment, which is the real issue I would have if we were really not collecting um, uh, stem cells well. So it's, it's a consideration but it's not one that I've seen that's led to significant problems. Why don't we go on to, uh, straight on to the second case. Um, so here we've got a 64 year old woman now um, presenting. She's got a previous medical history. She had a uh, myocardial infarction that left her with mildly impaired left ventricular function. Uh, she's got a raised creatinine, a creatinine clearance of, of 40 mils per minute. Uh, in November of 2016, she presented with neck swelling. A PET scan revealed metabolically active nodes above and below the diaphragm, no extranodal involvement, no high SUV. And a lymph node biopsy here showed that she had a marginal zone lymphoma with a hemoglobin of 115 grams per litre and her bone marrow was infiltrated with 40% of the cells. We could go through again the whole approach uh, of our treatment. I treated this woman with arbendamustine for six cycles, and I think uh, we would go through pretty much the same conversation again, but why don't we try? So Gilles, what would be your preferred first line treatment in this case, and what factors do you think about in, in making that, that approach? Well, this is um, a patient which is, who is not very old, but uh, had previous MI, left ventricular function impaired, correct inclement slow, so has some comorbidity. And I think bendamustine remains, to my point of view, in marginal zone lymphoma, when you have to give chemo, probably is a preferable option. Um, I think CHOP might not be a reasonable option given the heart issues. Single agent rituximab may be insufficient for such a patient. So we don't have many options for this patient. Um, I think we should take into consideration that um, sometimes in older patients, uh, we can use CHOP with limited dose of anthracycline. This has been long term, long experience in Europe with mini CHOP in, in indolent disease. But that for this patient in particular, I will have recommended the bendamustine as the first option, uh, being again careful given her comorbidities about the infection rates and, and, and so on. Now, John, I'm, I'm working on the premise that if you don't like using uh, rituximab maintenance in follicular lymphoma, you're not going to be looking to use it in marginal zone lymphoma either. I, 
I would agree. I mean, I think, uh, you know, shield data with the Prima study is the most robust data on maintenance and uh, that wouldn't uh, really apply to, to this uh, situation here. Uh, so I, I would uh, probably not use maintenance in this particular setting. So let's go back to the case again. I uh, treated her with arbendamustine for six cycles. She completed the arbendamustine treatment. I did not give this uh, woman maintenance therapy. And some more than, than two, so two and a half years later, she comes back presenting with lymphadenopathy, some night sweats and weight loss. Uh, but a repeat biopsy showed uh, a nodal marginal zone lymphoma with no um, evidence of transformation. So, Stefano, well, Stefan, sorry, what would you consider to be the things you think about in how you would consider treatment of relapse disease in this setting? This argument to discuss this case are not very different from the one that we used to discuss the previous case. However, the evidence that we have that is available uh, to support our discussion is, uh, is less important, less relevant. Uh, I would say very poor quality in terms of lacking a randomized trial to guide us on the decision, either for, for the frontline treatment, but even more for the, the relapsed setting. Uh, speaking about the real life management of a patient like that, uh, that is relapsing after our venda, uh, again, the discussion about the time to relapse is relevant because we show that uh, the time to relapse, the earlier the relapse, the worst scenario uh, for the patient, the worst uh, uh, chances of uh, uh, having a longer response uh, with the good duration of residual life uh, is seen. Uh, we should ma manage this patient with the option that we have available. And uh, sincerely speaking, there are very few available options. Uh, no new drugs are available and registered, at least uh, in, in my country. So uh, I think that this patient is eligible for anti-CD20 uh, single agent, or that would be my first choice uh, for another immunochemotherapy regimen and probably RCVT would be uh, my best choice for this, this patient. Okay, John, you're not living in a country mm -hmm. where there are um, uh, countrywide uh, Im uh, impactions on, on treatment. So how would, how would you uh, in New York uh, consider treating this woman at relapse? Well, I think things that uh, would cross our mind, uh, as was mentioned, was additional chemotherapy. Uh, I think that we have the R squared regimen for this uh, scenario, and I would uh, probably lean toward that regimen. Uh, I'd also mention that we have, uh, in the US, we have a Brutinib approved for marginal zone lymphoma. Um, the data, the response rates for relapse marginal zone lymphoma in the nodal subtype are about 40%, so not quite as what we've seen uh, for R squared. I think that would be lower on my list. Uh, we also have PI3 kinase inhibitors for recurrent indolent lymphoma patients, typically uh, after a few more pretreatments. So that would also be lower on my list. So I think I would, uh, I would lean toward R squared for this patient. Uh, we have data from um, both the uh, augment trial and the magnified trial that this can be an effective regimen. Uh, and I think, uh, again, similar to the prior study, uh, I, would in, I would be lean more toward against chemotherapy, partly because of this patient's comorbidities and because we have these other options. So, Gilles, um, so John's raised the issue of her comorbidities. So let's, let's imagine this patient's younger and has no comorbidities. Would that impact your, 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 your relapse treatment here? Well, I, I think the options that we discussed are... Um, not fully satisfactory for, for those patients because these patients with nodal marginal zone don't have a very good outcome. So I think I will try to offer a clinical trial. Um, I may discuss other kind of chemo regimen, you know, RSC, oxaliplatin based regimen or something like that, even with low dose uh, can achieve long responses in some of these patients with indolent uh, and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, Probably in the second line settings, there might be not many options in terms of clinical trials. If we were a little bit later, I think one of the options that appeared very recently and was presented uh, in recent meetings were CAR T cell for indolent disease. And uh, one of the study had shown that uh, the response rate is very high 
in the range of uh, 90%. And this is true for both follicular and marginal zone lymphoma. Um, it looks like there is a long benefit for follicular, at least on these very preliminary results. So I won't say long, but a, a one year substantial benefit at one year for follicular that may not fully apply with marginal zone, but the number of patients with marginal zone runs low. So I think I will discuss that as I will discuss eventually transplant in younger patients. But I think, again, given the fact that we don't have trials in this area, we need to discuss with the patient. And uh, I like John's idea of trying to use um, uh, BTK inhibitors that are in either approved or in development or, or look for possibility to, to apply to this patient. R square, a little bit less convinced about PI3 kinase in this setting, but I will also look for non-chemo approaches if feasible. Okay, so uh, going back to our patient again, she uh, I did treat her with uh, rituximab lenalidomide. Uh, she didn't tolerate it quite as well as the other patient we had before in terms of she had repeated episodes of neutropenia, but severe enough the requiring uh, do uh, frequent dose reductions and even dose interruptions despite the use of, of GCSF, but but got through um, the whole the whole treatment. But believe it or not, we're, we're right out of time. So let's um, think about what we've been hearing about today. What you've heard from our experts is that there are various approaches to the management of how you treat a, a patient with indolent non-Hodgkin's lymphoma frontline. The use of that frontline therapy, the duration of the first response, and the, 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 the comorbidities that the patient has at the time of relapse are all factors that they would take into account in terms of, 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 of how you would treat the patient next. And of course, now we have a, a patient involved in those discussions and patients often have very strong feelings about what kind of way they would like to think going forward. The role of, a, of, of maintenance, the role of transplant are all factors that factor into this. But um, these are, are, are difficult cases to manage and have to be thought on a case-by-case -case basis. And of course, taking advantage of the, the guidelines, taking advantage of the literature that's out there. And as, as Stefan has mentioned, also thinking about what are the agents that you have available in the market in which you are treating that patient. So with that, what I'd like to do is to thank uh, John Leonard, Stefan Luminari, and Gilles Sal for joining me here today. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and I thank you for participating in this activity. So please continue on to answer the questions that follow and be sure to complete the evaluation. This program was presented by Medscape Education Global.